Africa, the Swahili coast. Legend among local people speaks of a strange event many years ago. It's a day that would change their lives forever. A ghostly assemblage clouded the horizon. Even the blazing sun surrendered to its might. But this was no cloud. It was a fleet of unimaginable size. Giant billowing sails of red silk tower over huge ships. Mysterious pale-faced men in their thousands stride the decks in white robes with treasure from a faraway world. Passed down from father to son, this story slowly faded back into the sea, till no one really knew how big the ships really were, where these strangers had come from, or even if they had ever been at all. Because as suddenly as they appeared that day, they vanished, evaporated into the timeless ocean. This was the great treasure fleet from China, the Dragon Throne, the biggest fleet assembled on the world's oceans until the 20th century. So why did it disappear? And why was their great admiral virtually erased from the annals of history? 600 years later, National Geographic photographer Mike Yamashita sets off on his own epic journey. He'll search for traces of the fleet's seven voyages as he follows the trail of its visionary commander. A towering eunuch admiral, his name, Zhang He. about Zheng He last year, I was totally intrigued. How is it that I had ever heard of this guy before? He sailed 40,000 miles across the South China Seas and the Indian Ocean, decades before Columbus and Vasco da Gama had made it to the coast of Africa. The only way I can truly understand these great voyages is to make them myself and get a taste of the worlds that Zheng He and his crews must have experienced 600 years ago. We're on the decks of the Green Eyebrow, a hundred-foot replica of a renowned Song Dynasty junk at the mouth of the Yangtze, exactly where Zheng He started and ended. The great treasure fleet had hundreds of ships, some many times this size making China the undisputed ruler of the sea. Yet this unprecedented period of Chinese expansion would, one day, suddenly come to an end. The central enigma of the last millennium, I think, is why it's the West that is dominant today in the world rather than the East. Anybody for the first half of the last millennium would have been confident that it would be China who would be the major player in the world economy and in the global military. And instead, about halfway through the millennium, something happened, and in fact it was Europe and people of European stock who ended up triumphant today. The key question is how that came to happen. Twenty-seven thousand men, three hundred and seventeen ships, giants of the ocean. Some four hundred feet in length, under the masterly eye of its titanic leader. They 
they say his voice bellowed like a dozen thunderous bells, and his eyes glared down from his seven-foot frame. A formidable man, with power to wield as he chose, in peace or in war. My journey begins in Kunyang, in China's Yunnan province. It was here that Zhengfa spent his first 10 years. You know, for me, one of the most interesting pieces of the Zhengfa puzzle is how he got from a rural, totally landlocked farming village in Yunnan to become China's greatest seafaring explorer. Today, this village seems an idyllic place for a young boy to grow up. But Zhang He's childhood was anything but peaceful. of his life, Zhang He will serve in the Ming court as a eunuch. in Nanjing, the capital of the Ming Empire. He will now serve a rebellious prince who will one day reward him with one of the most powerful positions in China. Well, this is Nanjing, the capital of the Ming Dynasty, and it was from here that Zheng He made his early expedition.
A lot of Nanjing has been destroyed. There are only a few palace buildings left here today, which makes it hard to visualize what the world of the Ming court must have been like in the 15th century. It was probably right here where the emperor imagined how a colossal fleet of ships could lead to China's domination of the seas and perhaps even the globe. It's also here that the most concrete evidence of the treasure fleet has survived. Even today, the great admiral's unwavering eye surveys the scene 600 years on. This is the site where the treasure fleet was built, the Longjiang shipyard. But there is virtually nothing left of it today. The Chinese uncovered this series of dry docks here in Nanjing. They date it back to the 15th century. Can you imagine how astonished they must have been when they found these 350 meter long dry docks standing in a row? Shipyards of this scale could have been built for the construction of massive vessels. But how big was the question? One of the greatest controversies surrounding this whole Zhenghe episode was the size of his uh, treasure ship. Uh, some people believe that it's very large, 44 Chinese zhang, which equates to longer than a soccer field. Other people believe that it's a little bit smaller, the 2000 liao, which would be around 62 meters long. A lot of scholars believe that such a large ship existed. Some of the arguments that they put forward is the fact that Pyramids cannot be built today does not mean that pyramids was not built in the past. At 400 feet, the largest Baojuan would have been nearly five times as long as the ships of Columbus, which sailed almost a century later. Deep in the mud of one dry dock, they made a further discovery. It lies today in the Nanjing Museum. So this is it. The rudder from one of Zhenghe's ships found at the bottom of the Longjiang shipyards. Unbelievable. It must be 40 feet long. This controversy still rages on, unless and until uh, there are more evidence that can be found uh, from, from archaeology or, or historical sources. I think this will continue to remain a mystery. The precise length may never be known, but there's little doubt that the great treasure ships were high-tech marvels. In scale alone, they were centuries ahead of their time. But the ship's real genius lay just below their 70,000 square foot decks. Here, a cutting edge design protected the treasure ships from sinking. Each hull was divided into 13 watertight compartments. If one was damaged and flooded, the remaining compartments could keep the ship afloat. But that wasn't their only purpose. Now, the interesting fact is that in this last compartment, it is sometimes open to the sea so that when the vessel is coming down a wave, water enters the compartment, thereby lifting the bow of the vessel and enabling the vessel to drive safely out of the wave. The design may sound complex, but its inspiration came from something that was all around them, a simple stalk of bamboo. It would take nearly 400 years for Western naval architects to incorporate this same technology. Zhang He personally commanded these highly advanced fleets on six of their seven voyages, but ultimately they were the brainchild of the man he served. 
A cunning military leader, Ju Di, personally led his troops to victory over the Mongol hordes. Then he turned his attention towards seizing the throne. the Emperor's side was the man he'd come to depend on in his military exploits, Zhang He. As a reward, the Emperor appointed him Admiral of the Treasure Fleet. And soon he would set off as the face of China to the world. The Emperor had quickly sought ways to legitimize his power and forge a legacy that would match his colossal ego. The result? Some of the most ambitious construction projects the world has ever known. And this is probably the most famous. The Great War. emperors had built stages of this wall, but it was Judy who ordered that it be constructed in stone. All 6,000 kilometers of it. This is just one of the massive projects he got into. But even the son of heaven, Judy, had to realize there was a limit. The remains of a more unusual project stands outside Nanjing. The Emperor's plan for a giant tribute to his father that involved the assembly of three massive stones. I tackle the base stone first. It's like a small mountain, but there's more. This was just the base of a planned memorial that would have been 25 stories high. The Emperor's plan was insane and was never actually completed because it would have weighed 34,000 tons and that would have been impossible to move. Today, they stand as a tribute, not to his father as intended, but to his own mammoth ambition. In nearby Nanjing, the design, construction, and launching of the treasure fleet was no less impressive and far more successful. The leader of this great endeavor was Zhang He. It took two short years for the entire fleet to be constructed, but the conservative Confucians took a very dim view.
the central tension in 15th century China was between the eunuchs, who were close to the emperor, and wanted to make money and were willing to try new things, were willing to explore, and were very much dominated by the Zhenghe camp. The Confucian scholars, on the other hand, were rooted in the past. They had a stake in the way things had always been done, and they did not want to try new things, did not want to explore. By 1405, hundreds of ships gathered on the Yangtze River outside the capital Nanjing, ready for their maiden voyage. It was like a floating city. The ship's cargo bays were filled with the best that China had to offer. Tons of the finest silks and the world-famous blue and white Ming porcelain that would be prized among kingdoms across the Indian Ocean. It was an amazing display of might to prove China's preeminence to the world. On the eve of the voyage, Zhang He had a simple tribute to his father engraved. By nature, he was especially fond of encountering those who were impoverished or distressed, including widows, orphans, and others with no one to rely on. There was no one in this community who did not look up to him. He was content as an ordinary commoner, yet cherished the bestowal of extraordinary favors. It is fitting that he should have had offspring, illustrious in their own times. But the world Chang He was heading into was dark and unsettled. A final offering to the patron saint of sailors, Tian Fei, requested her blessings. Little did they know it wouldn't be long before her protection was needed. Finally, I too am ready to set sail to discover the worlds that Zheng He and the treasure fleet explored six centuries before me. From the mouth of the Yangtze River, I head south just as Zheng He and his crew did for the first time in the autumn of 1405. Our goal is to reach the Malabar coast of India, the destination of all seven voyages of the treasure fleets. Our guide, the journal of a 25-year-old translator, Ma Huan. It's the only remaining eyewitness account of the sights, sounds, and people along the routes of the fleet. As we pass the coast of Vietnam, Ma Huan's writings begin to come alive. Going southwest for 100 li, you come to the city where the king resides. Most of the men take up fishing for a livelihood. They seldom go in for agriculture. Was Ma Huan talking about these same fishing communities? Where men pick their way through the surf like great cranes in search of prey, as they have for hundreds of years. My journey soon takes me further south to the island of Java, Indonesia. Here in the port of Gresik, I decide to come ashore 
It's the only way I can reach one of the most amazing sights that Jung Ho probably witnessed in the early stages of his journey. Eerie. Bleak. Timeless. The crater of Ejen Volcano. Nothing seems to have changed here for centuries. These men still pry the sulfur out by hand in toxic fumes that are almost unbearable. In his journal, Ma Huan described this scene. The mountains produce sulfur, which comes from the inside of caves. Plants and trees will not grow on these mountains. The earth and rocks are all a bright color. These loads of sulfur can be up to 100 kilograms. That's more than their own body weight. With all this smoke and the yellow sulfur and this incredible scenery, it doesn't get any better than this for a photographer. Indonesia was a lure for its spices, but in the 15th century it was also unstable. Its inhabitants were known to be violent. As Ma Huang said, if there is a battle of words when they are crazy with drunkenness, they at once pull out their knives and stab each other. When they were a threat to stability, Jung He sometimes used force to settle conflicts. But in Indonesia, he is best remembered for his diplomacy. Today, in the city of Semarang in central Java, Jung He is honored as a god. He even has his own temple. Every year, thousands of devotees from across the region come here to pray for his blessings. Then, his veiled image is carried through the town. celebration that lasts an entire day with worshippers performing a traditional dragon dance in his honor centuries he was virtually unknown in China but here in Indonesia his deeds have never been forgotten as the treasure fleet did by heading up through the Malacca Strait, one of the most treacherous waterways in the world. Maybe it was here that the fleet was caught in a violent storm. Terrified that underwater dragons would bring the great ships down, the crew prayed to their goddess, Tianfei. According to Ma Huan, Suddenly there was a magic lantern in the mast, and the danger was becalmed. 
For Jung He, this was a sign that his fleet was under divine protection. But another threat was on the horizon. Pirates. Today, the Straits of Malacca remains one of the busiest and most dangerous waterways in the world. Pirates from Indonesia routinely attack freighters heading to China and the Indian Ocean. And the early 15th century was no different. A Chinese pirate named Chen Juyi had seized control of the area and his heavily armed junks plundered any passing ship. His forces were swift and deadly. He was a genuine threat to trade and that had to be dealt with. Keeping an upwind position, Zhang He lured him into a trap from which he would never escape. Chen Juyi was captured and executed, and so peace was restored. This wouldn't be the only time Zhang He would use his military power to deal with threats at sea. With the danger of the pirates now removed, Zhang He set up a number of strategic trading posts, which would lead to one of his greatest legacies, the founding of the overseas Chinese, the largest of which is in Malacca, on the west coast of Malaysia. Legend has it that the Ming Emperor gifted a princess to Malacca's local sultan and 500 Chinese maidens, who intermarried with local men. Their descendants are said to be buried here on this hill called Bukit China, the biggest Chinese graveyard outside China. But Zhang He's legacy is very much alive. <laughs> These men will take part in a Hindu festival. It's one of the most extreme religious practices in the world. This ritual is from India, but here in Malacca, it's practiced by ethnic Chinese. One such worshiper is Aaron. So Aaron, how do you feel? Are you afraid about pain? No, I'm used to it. How many times have you done this? Uh, this is my second time. You're going to skewer yourself with that long needle. I don't do it myself, but there is somebody who help me around. Where will you put it? Through. For Aaron, like the others, piercing himself is an expression of devotion. By piercing his body, he thanks the gods for favors granted. Okay, why do you do this? It's part of my religious culture to follow up. But it's interesting that this is an Indian festival and you're doing this because it's from generation to generation since to my great grandmother up to today. I can't see his face, but that's really painful. You can see the way those needles are really pulling at the skin. The most amazing thing is there's no blood. Wow. If that doesn't hurt, I don't know what does. Looking at all the faces, this is a powerful, if not unusual, blending of cultures. From 
Malacca, the treasure fleet enters the vast open waters of the ocean as it heads toward its destination, the riches of the Indian Malabar coast. The achievement of moving 300 boats and 28,000 men around the Indian Ocean Basin was extraordinary. They were navigating by the stars. They were, the only time calculation they had was um, a candle, and they were measuring the speed of the boat by dropping a stick off the bow, and as it passed, they would recite a rhyme. These were extremely crude navigational tools, and yet they managed to get from point to point in the Indian Ocean Basin with extreme accuracy. According to legend, this place was so beautiful, it was God's compensation to Adam and Eve for the loss of paradise. But the island was poisoned by centuries of turmoil. Sri Lanka. Thousands converge on Asia's biggest festival, the magnificent Pera Era. Ten days of mesmerizing devotion. Parading for hours, they celebrate and pay homage. It's a tribute befitting a king or an emperor. High above the revelers, though, it's a tooth thought to be that of the Buddha that is paraded through the streets. No one knows the tooth's exact origins, but some say it was gifted to a local king more than 1,500 years ago. century, this relic was one of the island's most coveted possessions. To steal it would surely be sacrilege. Whatever his intentions for the Buddha's tooth, the inhabitants of this island were suspicious of Zhang He or any outsiders, especially those who were heavily armed. But this was an island in a constant state of ethnic conflict, and after centuries of civil war, it seemed unrelenting. Would Zhang He be able to make a difference, or would it lead to more bloodshed? I begin my journey to find out what happened here by heading to Sri Lanka's towering religious icon, Adam's Peak. At the center of this island, it stands like a beacon of inspiration and hope. Oh. Pilgrims from all over, old and infirm, all make the brutal ascent to its summit. Almost there. We're here, the top of Adam's Peak for sunrise. Every explorer from Marco Polo to Ibn Battuta has been up here, and we're here because Zheng He talks about this sacred mountain in the clouds. Adam's Peak is a place of worship for Hindus, Buddhists, and even Christians. There are no tensions here, just shrines, worshippers, and a stunning view.
But in the forests down below, ethnic groups have been battling each other for generations. On the way down are riverbeds famous for producing some of the finest gems in the world. Rubies, topaz and sapphires. Local folklore says they are the crystallized tears of the Buddha, shed for the island's centuries of suffering. A paradise, lost to the failings of mankind. European voyages were not only trade voyages, but they were very much religious endeavors to convert non-Christians to Christianity. They were crusades. Keen to establish peace, Zheng He presents a gift to the local Buddhist chief, a tablet written in three languages, Chinese, Tamil, and Persian. The Chinese were extremely respectful of all the religions that they encountered on their voyages, as exemplified by the wonderful triptych in Ceylon, to all of the gods of the islands, to Buddha, to Allah, and to the Hindu gods. And very carefully articulated in the tablet is equal gifts for all, all got exactly the same. The Chinese had none of the religious vigor of, of Western exploration. This was an offering of peace to an island at war. But a Buddhist chief rejected the gift and refused to pay tribute to the Chinese emperor. Continued instability was unacceptable to Zhang He, and it would come at a severe cost to the warring chiefs. The treasure fleet prepares to invade. Straight away, their dens and hideouts we ravaged and made captive that entire country. These insignificant worms do not even merit the punishment of heaven. And so, Zhang He's use of force led to a period of relative stability. Importantly for China, trade could now flourish. But only decades later, the island again descended into war. To this day, ethnic conflict continues. Rukshan is Sinhalese, and his wife Viji is Tamil. They represent two of the groups that are at odds with each other. Maybe they can help me understand why the island has suffered for so long. Ethnic conflict in Sri Lanka is an age-old thing. It's been going on for at least 2,000 years, especially between the Tamils and the Sinhalese. Ethnicity has been redefined by politicians and that causes uh, people to view each other with suspicion and a sense of us and them. We have to learn to share this island. It's not a very big place. It has to begin at an individual level. People have to start seeing other people as human beings first and not as members of one ethnic group or another. You know, it's here in Sri Lanka that Jung Ha really shows himself to be the true visionary that he is in that remarkable three-language stele. But today, it's locked away. Me 
Maybe the fact that he's a eunuch and a non-Chinese, an outsider, gave him the perspective to encourage harmony and religious tolerance. In Sri Lankan history, Jiang He is seen as a man of war, and the memory of his peace offering has faded away, as a wave ebbs into the ocean. hero of the treasure fleet. But this golden age of expansion and engagement with the world is about to come to an end. Arguably the worst foreign policy blunder that any country has ever made was China's decision in the 1400s to abandon Zheng He's explorations and instead to, to close the country, to turn inward. And the result was that China's trade vanished, its economy began to diminish, and that it found itself on a, on a downward escalator, which it found itself impossible to get off of. The treasure fleet will set off to even more distant shores, the entire world within its grasp. Jung He and the colossal treasure ships will vanish almost without a trace. The dawn of the 15th century. China is the unrivaled ruler of the seas, with an almighty grip on power that seems unstoppable. Nothing compares to the scale of China's treasure fleet. 27,000 men, 317 ships. They must have been worlds unto themselves, with enough supplies to last for months, and cargo bays of treasure fit for kings. But soon the fleet would vanish, and China would close its doors to the outside world. National Geographic photographer Mike Yamashita continues his journey to discover what happened to this great age of expansion and the man who was at its helm, the towering eunuch admiral Zhang He, who in his lifetime was hailed as a hero in China. to Africa, we follow the voyages of China's greatest explorer, Zhang He. For nearly 30 years, he led the treasure fleet on seven epic voyages. It was a feat centuries ahead of its time. China was incredibly more advanced scientifically, culturally, and economically. Uh, it amounted for by far the largest share of the, the world economy. Maybe the best measure of China's sophistication was that it was not until World War I that Europe and the West were finally able to put together a fleet as sophisticated as China had in the early 15th century. From China, we've traveled through the South China Sea and across the Great Indian Ocean. Beyond Sri Lanka, like Zheng He, we turn north. The promise of exotic spice 
has always been a lure for adventurers. And somewhere along this coast, we'll find that precious commodity all traders sought. In those days, it was known as black gold. Malabar pepper. I think it's the most famous pepper in the world because its history goes back the furthest. Yeah, it's got a name and it still commands a huge premium in the market. I meet up with Arun Ramakrishnan, whose family has been trading pepper for generations. What's uh, special about Malabar pepper? Well, it's got a special aroma. It's what lends it its flavor. I'm at a pepper go down in, in Calicut. And this is the reason why Zheng He stopped here on all of his voyages. He was coming to buy the black gold pepper. This was the, uh, the most precious of all the uh, trading goods that Zheng He came in search of. What they're doing here is pushing the uh, pepper through little holes, and that's what we're talking about grading, because the big stuff, only the biggest peppercorns will be left in this tray after this process. So, Arun, so this is the pepper grading going on over here with these women. What's going on over there? There you have a, a buyer and a seller. You have the broker in between. So. They'll negotiate the price under the handkerchief. I think so, you so hold two as 200. Right. Or 300. Right. Or maybe cool. I think this is 500. Right. You know anything about the history? Do you think it might go back to Zheng He days when, when well, Arabs and Chinese and Indians were trading and maybe didn't speak the same language? It could well be because we sit in one room and we don't even have to speak. Right, right. You can just trade and without having to speak at all. You Great can just system. say yes, no. Wonderful. It's enough to just shake your head. In nearby Sri Lanka, Zheng He was drawn into the war between the island's ethnic groups. But here in India, there was no such conflict, and exchange flourished. The Chinese called the port of Calicut the great country of the Western Ocean. As Ma Huan, the treasure fleet's young Muslim chronicler, wrote, the people are very honest and trustworthy. Their appearance is smart fine and distinguished. The fleet would anchor for months as Chinese and Indian traders bartered for goods and filled the ships with pepper, pearls, precious stones and coral. All in all, Zheng He probably spent years here. Perhaps it's why these Chinese fishing nets are still here. These nets were brought here sometime between 1350 and 1450, which means Zheng He could have easily been the person who brought these to the Malabar coast. What's wonderful is they're still using them. In the nearby port of Cochin, local Suresh Moni reveals why the Malabar coast was such a stable trading partner for Zheng He and the Chinese in the 15th century. Suresh, Zheng He stopped here on all seven of his voyages. It was almost yes. like a second home to him here. Yeah. Ma Huan mentions that the people were very prosperous and happy. The Indian people here are, are, got along very well together. Now, why was that? This has been a place uh, in India, or Malabar Coast, which, where the people actually have a very high religious harmony, in fact. We got Christians, Muslims, and Hindus all over here. 
they live together, they work together. All these different religions, and yet everybody got along well together. Oh, yes, of course. For example, you can see the mosque just behind us and the Christian church further down. And there's also a Hindu temple on the other side of the road. Here in India, Jung He found the kind of religious harmony he tried to forge in Sri Lanka. This stability, along with the flourishing pepper trade, made India China's biggest trading partner for the time. As we travel down the coast, we hear rumors of the world's largest wooden ship under construction. These backwaters are deceptively silent. The forests are teeming with activity and the production of trade goods. One item to be found up in these trees is surprisingly useful. We're at a coconut processing factory. Here we've got the husk. This is from what the core comes from. Got a couple of guys unloading boats over here. Let's see what it looks like. Mahwan describes at least 10 uses for the coconut. You can drink it, you can eat it, you can use the oil for cooking. The shell is good for cups and bowls. The tree is good for building houses and the leaves for roofing those houses. But most important of all, it's the fiber that's made into rope and used for shipbuilding. This is unbelievable more than twice the size of one of Vasco da Gama's ships. This is an Arab dhow made out of 100% Malaysian teak and destined to be sailed over to the Middle East in the next couple of weeks. Just look at the size of that piece of wood they just brought aboard. It's probably the biggest wooden ship anyone's ever likely to see in the 21st century. Yet the great treasure ships were more than double this size. But size alone can't guarantee the survival of these giants. Forces at home are already conspiring against them. In the 15th century, China was the world's great superpower. And Zheng He, its greatest explorer. His voyages took him thousands of miles across dangerous stretches of ocean. But his biggest threat was not to be found at sea. In 1402, an ambitious prince, Zhu Di, wages an all-out battle for the dragon throne. He installs himself as emperor. Tradition-bound Confucians are suspicious of Judy's ambition. They warn him the heavens are angry and will one day take revenge.
According to a Persian envoy, it was like the light of a hundred thousand torches. To many, it was proof that the Emperor, Judy, had lost the Mandate of Heaven. If the treasure fleet were to be halted, it would bring China's trade with the outside world to an end. But that isn't all that's at stake. An unprecedented period of cultural exchange is threatened with extinction. It's said that China's most famous martial art, Kung Fu, originated in India. In Kerala, Sunil Kumar's family has practiced the traditional South Indian martial art of Kalari for generations. Well, tell me a little bit about what you know best, Kalari Payat. Yes. Historians believe this is the mother of all martial art forms. Kalari was practiced by Buddhist monks and Hindu saints as a means of protection. In the 6th century, an Indian monk introduced this ancient art form to the Shaolin Temple in China. That, many believe, was the birth of Kung Fu. And just like Kung Fu, Kalari takes its movement from the animals. of uh, Kalari is being related to uh, Kalari, animals. we are doing eight postures. Elephant posture is for getting the strength in the body. Uh, the, the, there is some special measurement for that and go and stay like that. And... Snake posture, that is for getting the flexibility. Only the snake can move forward and backward, wherever they need to burn. the leaping. One we are adopted from the fish and also from the cat. Kung Fu is one of China's most famous exports. Who would have thought that it actually came from India? Cultural exchange was not limited to martial arts. When trade flourishes, so does culture. The treasure fleet was much more than a vehicle of power and trade. They brought worlds together on an entirely new scale. Finally, we leave India and follow the treasure fleet west. Like Zheng He, we set out across the Arabian Sea 
toward the coast of modern-day Yemen. southern Yemen on the Red Sea and to my right up north is Mecca and to my left down south is Africa. There was a lot of trade going on here between Arabs and Africans and Indians as well as the Chinese when Zheng He arrived 600 years ago. The interesting thing about this Yemen coastline is this mix of cultures. You've got you got a mosque over there, and you got an African village behind me. And that's just the way it was, back, even back in Zheng He's day. If the treasure fleet was after exotic goods, this was one of the best places to find them, and still is today. We're in Hodeida, the biggest fishing port on the Red Sea. Sharks everywhere. I've seen the one in Tsukiji, and it doesn't even come near comparing in size, at least for the sharks. They're tossing tons of sharks out of the boats. The big ones can't even be lifted by one person. We've seen all kinds, from hammerheads to threshers. You can't help but feel a little sorry for the sharks, especially when you're watching them getting their fins cut off. And obviously, the fins are what uh, the Chinese are interested in. And all of that will be heading to China for shark fin soup. Bargaining and noise, and everybody's excited. It looks like they're fighting when they're, when they're bargaining. I have no idea what they're saying, but obviously those catches are worth a lot and everybody wants a piece of the action. This has got to be the mother of all shark markets. It's possible that Zheng He loaded his ships with sharks from markets like this. But for him, the real prize lay further inland. Well, from Yemen and Oman, I think Zheng He is mainly looking for frankincense and myrrh. They use it as incense, as the Arabs do, and they also use it as a form of medicine. This and Somalia are the only spots in the world where it comes from. It comes from the interior, deep into the most inhospitable parts of the globe. It was brought to the coastlines by long trains of caravans of camels. Today, frankincense and myrrh can be found here on the back streets of Yemen's ancient capital, Sana'a. <laughs> Frankincense. That's frankincense, Mike. It smells great. Tell me about it. Yeah, frankincense is that they collect it from the bark of the trees, nearly in Hadramaut, normally in Hadramaut, and the borders of Oman, which is called the far area. And they make a hole in a tree, and then the second day they come together all this from the tree itself, from the bark. And they sell it in kilograms, or also in grams as well. There are different sorts of myrrh, 
in That's Simpsons rankings. Mur? That's Murrah here. And this comes from the same place? From the same place, but different trees. Different trees. Right. Fanish so this is, a, this is the sap from the tree? That's the sap from the tree, and that's from the so bark. So is this? Oh, this is from the bark? That's from the bark. Oh, that's right. Not. That's right. It has a nice smell. Well, they burn it up, actually. They burn it up on coal, charcoal, and then it becomes a very nice incense. Trading for frankincense and myrrh brought Zhang He's expeditions repeatedly to the Middle East. But he may have had more personal reasons to follow his faith in the footsteps of his father. We're in Jibla, going to Queen Arawa's mosque built in the 11th century as a part of a university to, to teach Islam. You know, this is one of the most beautiful mosques I've seen yet in, in Yemen. It's the architecture with, with those wonderful uh, arches and columns. The weather was just perfect today, and the sun's shining, bouncing off that white tile in the courtyard. Most of all, there are all those worshippers praying and reading the Quran. And in a country where it's hard to actually even get in a mosque, it's a very unusual situation. You know, Zheng He, as a Muslim, must have been dying to get to Mecca. His father made the pilgrimage before he was born. And his family were Muslims who came from Central Asia. Now, Zheng He, when he came here to Yemen, may have worshipped in an ancient mosque like this one. Whether he made it to Mecca or not is another story. We are led to believe in the last voyage, the voyage in which he died, that he may have gone on a pilgrimage to Mecca. And if he, if he didn't, if he didn't actually get there, he certainly wanted to um, very much. Whether Zheng He fulfilled his spiritual quest may never be known. By the time Zheng He comes here to Aden, as Yemen was called in those days, he's not really looking for prophets. He wants basically to show the world his power. China's power is the greatest country of the world. And that's why, of course, he's traveling with 300 ships with 27,000 soldiers and these huge treasure ships of 400 foot length. It's a big show of power. He's not here to conquer. He's not here to occupy. He just wants to show the world we're the greatest. But back in China, the world's most powerful empire was in crisis. The days of Zheng He and the treasure fleets are numbered. As commander of a floating army, Zheng He would have appeared unstoppable and the entire world must have seemed within his grasp. Judy could well have saved the treasure fleet. As Judy's body is laid to rest, so with it is his vision for China as a global superpower. His expansionist projects and severe famine had seriously depleted the imperial treasury.
Within a year, Confucian influence begins to dominate. Confucian philosophy, I think, stressed that the empire should be self-sufficient, that the trade was really unnecessary. You didn't want foreigners interfering in your country. The son should not go abroad because he couldn't attend to the filial obligations of his ancestors. Trade was base and demeaning and not well respected by the Confucians. Treasure Fleet has made six legendary voyages, forged diplomatic relations with dozens of rulers and kings, made an encyclopedic study across 10,000 miles of ocean in 67 overseas states. We've seen all the major countries and places where the treasure fleets traveled, but there is one final location, Africa. We're arriving in Lamu, the biggest Arab Dao left in the Indian Ocean, just as Zheng He would have seen it from the deck of a 400-foot treasure ship. And it just looks beautiful. We're here to solve one of the greatest mysteries of the treasure fleet. Legend has it a shipwreck left a number of Zheng He's sailors on an island off Africa's Swahili coast. After marrying local women, they created a community of their own, known today as the Wushanga part of the Famao clan. Perhaps Zhang He's crew settled on this coast more than 80 years before Vasco da Gama. But can we find evidence that the legend is real? I'm heading to Pate Island with Badi who promises he can introduce me to a surviving member of the Famao. So, how long have you known Mrs. Baraka? For quite some time, actually. Does she really look Chinese, buddy? Oh, yes. Really? I'm really looking forward to, to meeting her and taking her picture. You will see her definitely. It's definitely worth the wait. Locals say there are fewer than a hundred Famao scattered on different islands. Oh, but I, uh, Mike, no, Mike, Miss Mama Baraka. Mrs. Baraka, nice yeah. to meet you. Nice to meet you. So, Buddy, if you could ask Mrs. Baraka a few questions. Could I ask her f uh, how long has she lived here in the village? Oh, she had been here since she was born. What must have that been like at age 20 to be told that your great, 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 great grandfather or whatever was Chinese? Among the older generation, uh, like the grandfathers, the great grandmothers, and grand great grands, all knew that their ancestry really belonged to that Chinese shipwrecked people, and that was handed over from uh, one generation to the other until 
Idrisa. She shows me a piece of pottery she thinks was brought here on the treasure fleets. Uh, yeah. Is was that the only piece? Can I say? Well, I'm no expert. Looks like the real thing to me. Mm, it looks like. The nearby Famao graveyard looks very familiar. These Chinese-style graves even have Ming pottery for decoration. It's hard to tell from her face alone that Mrs. Baraka's origins are Chinese, but her story certainly seems convincing. For generations, the Famao have also passed down an unusual tale. Africa was, of course, Zheng Ho's El Dorado. It's a great mystery as to how these very remote people who speak no English, who of course read no Chinese, they had such amazingly specific details that the emissary from the Emperor of China had come to Malindi and that the King of Malindi had given them two giraffes. One of the giraffes had died on the way back to China. Were they truly descended from shipwrecked Chinese sailors? Um, how did they acquire this knowledge? down the coast to Tanzania. We're in Zanzibar, the famous spice island of the Swahili coast. This is probably the furthest point south that Zheng Ho would have come on his trip to Africa. It was an important trading town even then, kind of a depot for goods coming in from the interior. He probably would have traded for ivory and rhino horn and gold here, as well as the spices. As I'm looking at this incredible blue-green water out there, I'm imagining how amazing it must have been to watch 300 ships coming in on the horizon. It must have been just an incredible sight. When the fleet returned from Africa to the Forbidden City, it was carrying some of the most exotic gifts the throne would ever receive. A giraffe from an African king. Spectacular proof of the tribute paid to the dragon throne. The now aging Zheng He is called to launch the giant treasure fleet once again. But Confucian grip on power has all but sealed China's fate. Just as he had 26 years earlier, on the eve of his first voyage, the aging admiral sits down to write. This would be his epitaph.
we have traversed more than 100,000 li of immense water spaces. And have beheld in the ocean huge waves like mountains rising sky high. We have set eyes on barbarian regions far away, hidden in a blue transparency of light vapors. Our sails loftily unfurled like clouds day and night, continued their course as rapidly as a star, traversing those savage waves. But for all his achievements, there's one place missing, a place where his father had gone, Mecca. In 1431, the fleet is launched for the last time. What happened to Jung He next may never be known. The early part of the Ming Dynasty remains China's greatest stage of progress. a harnessing of power that mesmerizes, and achievement on a scale the world rarely sees. It's not surprising, therefore, that in preparation for his death, the emperor, Zhu Di, had a vast burial site built just outside Beijing. These are the Ming tombs. These statues serve as a permanent reminder to the world of the emperor's power and vision. Remote, magnificent, a gigantic edifice in stone. But for his trusted friend, the great admiral, there would be no such remembrance. Just like his gigantic ships, he too seems to have vanished. Outside Nanjing, a simple tomb stands in his name, in both Chinese and Arabic. But the tomb is empty. Perhaps Zhang He was on his way to Mecca when he finally succumbed to the rigors of a lifetime at sea. His body, as the Muslim faith demanded, would be wrapped in a white shroud and delivered to the waters below. Why did China not come to dominate the world? The first reason is, in a sense, they weren't greedy enough. China was then about all kinds of things. It was about filial piety, about honor, about Confucianism. The second reason, I think, is a kind of a culture of complacency. They were inward looking in a way that I'm afraid the West has become today. And uh, as a result, uh, there was a lot of opposition to the idea of going abroad. When the Confucians came to wrest control from the eunuchs and make these catastrophic mistakes, then they condemned the entire Chinese people for the next 500 years. The treasure fleet may have disappeared, but Zhang He's legacy lives on in communities all over the world, linking diverse cultures and religions. In Indonesia, Buddhists worship him as a god. While these young Muslims learn to read from a Quran in a mosque dedicated to his name. His preaching of religious tolerance is still a lesson for us today. Perhaps his greatest legacy may be the settling of Chinese communities abroad.
the voyages of Zhang He enabled members of ancient Chinese villages like this one, home to a group called the Hake, to leave China and seek their fortunes in Southeast Asia, India, the Middle East, and even Africa. Today, there are over 35 million Chinese living abroad, 20 million in Southeast Asia alone. It's estimated that these Chinese hold liquid assets worth 1.5 to 2 trillion dollars. And this is thanks in part to the voyages of Zhang He. Yet this great story of Zhang He and the treasure fleet has virtually been erased from history. 600 years ago, China just wasn't ready to accept the achievements of a man ahead of his time. Now history comes full circle, and China seems ready to embrace the outside world. Today, most of us think uh, that the natural order of things is a rich and powerful West and a weak and poor East. But in fact, for most of human history, it's been the other way around. The upshot is, I think, that the 21st century will belong to India and China. And beyond that, that the entire third millennium will be Asia's once more. Zhang He has finally been recognized as a celebrated hero. the perfect figure for China's modern-day spirit of openness and engagement with the outside world. Today, the great treasure ships have been replaced with new giants of the ocean. The world is, once again, within China's grasp. History may be repeating itself, but chances are, this time, China won't turn back.